Uh, hey, well, just so, a couple of words, Karen, if I can, first of all, just yeah, to say absolutely. thank you to everyone for, for joining us today. I think there are a few more that will trickle along as we go. Um, but that's great. So for those of you, uh, I think most of you that are here at the moment um, already know Dr. Karen O'Sullivan. Um, so Karen is a physiotherapist and a researcher based in Qatar with a wealth of clinical and research experience in musculoskeletal pain, um, particularly low back pain. Um, so we're really grateful, Karen, that you have volunteered to be to present the inaugural Opus webinar. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing your talk today about um, your endeavours in the space of public health education, um, changing people's beliefs in low back pain. That's a subject that I am very passionate about, really interested in. So yeah, we'll pass over the reins to you and Michelle to do a little housekeeping. Thank mm -hmm. you. Lovely. Um... So thank you very much, Sam, and to everybody for having me. Um, I'm just going to let Michelle go through some of the housekeeping first um, in terms of uh, how to interact, especially when it's the first time we're all on board. So I'll leave this with you, Michelle, for a moment. Absolutely. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, with regards to the way this session is going to be running, we're first going to have Kieran presenting. Uh, throughout his presentation, I am going to be muting everyone. So if you do have any questions for Kieran, you can interact through the Q&A box. So that one you should see in your navigational panel right next to the participants. So you can see uh, we have the navigational panel shown on this slide. Uh, if you click on participants, you've got uh, a list of the attendees and the list of the hosts here. If you do want to, uh, ask a question, you can always raise your hand. So there is a button there in that panel. Um, a more formal question that you would like answered, we can have that answered live as Kieran presents. Um, you can write that there. Uh, we can type the answer in, but most likely Kieran will answer it live. Uh, and that, that will be moderated by myself. If you do have any troubleshooting questions, things like sorry, I'm cutting out, my internet connection is not great, you can always use the chat room box. So that you can uh, type to whoever you want. So you can see on that slide, uh, on the right hand side, you can select if you want to send a message to everyone or if you want to send a message just to myself or Sam or Kieran, um, just let us know and we'll be monitoring those boxes. Uh, that's about it. If you do have any questions, just use the chat room um, and we can flick over any questions that you have to Kieran. And that's about it. I'll pass it on. Perfect. Uh, thanks very much, Michelle. And I'll just check with you that uh, what I can do intermittently is just check the Q&A box up at the top to see if this message is coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So if okay. you, oh, I'll just uh, pipe in. If you do want to raise a hand and you do want to um, ask a question, I'll be unmuting you, and once that question is over, I'll mute you again. So, that's it. Yeah, that would be a handy skill in, in life in general, Michelle, wouldn't it? <laughs> Choosing when we can mute and unmute people. Um, okay, so uh, I'll move on, and I guess we'll talk a little bit about, um, I'm just going to move the cameras a little bit for my own view. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about changing low back pain beliefs and whether the media, uh, broadly mass media, newspapers and so on, are more contemporary social media, Facebook and so on, whether it can help. Uh, and obviously I know we're talking in terms of opus, uh, not about back pain, but I think there are a lot of parallels. Um, first of all, I guess, rather than talking about back pain itself, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my own background. Um, so in terms of my background, I qualified as physiotherapist. And like a lot of physiotherapists, I went into it um, thinking I would only be treating people with soft tissue injuries like hamstring injuries and ankle sprains and so on. And I thought like a lot of people that when you got injured, all you really had to do was get the tissues to heal. So the ligaments to repair the muscle to regenerate, and then the person gets better. And the only reason you would have ongoing problems was if the damage was particularly bad or the rehabilitation or surgery didn't work. I had little, in fact, almost no insight whatsoever into, um, into other factors that might be involved in pain. And I don't think I'm any more um, ignorant or kind of um, poorly read at that stage than most members of the public. My beliefs were probably reflective of those of my family, friends and colleagues and so on. Um, 
and then of course when I developed my own make some pains, I had quite a bit of back pain for a while, I interpreted it in a way that didn't help and my own beliefs became a big part of my own ongoing back pain and I then very helpfully passed on these unhelpful beliefs to my patients. So even though with the best of intentions I was trying to help people, I was in many cases I think perpetuating their problem uh, with the best of intentions but essentially reinforcing unhelpful beliefs. Um, and I think we've got to change that on a big, big scale, not just changing individual doctors and physios one at a time. So in terms of back pain, what do we know? We know it's, it's a huge problem. You know, all the facts and figures back that up. There's also evidence of people having unhelpful beliefs. And people like Sam have done a lot of work in this, interviewing people with back pain and showing that the things they think, first of all, are inaccurate, but not just inaccurate and benign, but an inaccurate and probably unhelpful. Okay, and that they might be the kind of things that if you believe are more likely to lead to long-term problems. There's also lots of evidence that people receive care which doesn't seem to be optimal or ideal. And this is not great in terms of the, maybe there's something more effective and even probably to a greater degree, probably things which are cheaper because we have people um, with, with back pain spending a lot of money on treatments that cost a lot of money and seem to have little effect. And of course, while there's, you know, People differ and research papers differ in their findings. When you look across the guidelines for back pain, they are remarkably consistent. Um, and if you look at the big systematic reviews and NICE guidelines and American College of Physician recommendations, yes, you could focus on the 5% of differences between them. But essentially, there's very common themes like don't rush for imaging such as x-ray or MRI unless there are very specific indications. We should be very cautious about using what we might call stronger medications like opioids or antineuropathics, and we shouldn't rush into um, surgical options too quickly. There is increasingly recognition that we need to consider comorbidities in the broadest sense of the world. Um, and that there, there's a strong role for educating people to self-manage their condition and increase activity levels. And I wouldn't be totally on top of the guidelines for knee osteoarthritis, but my understanding is they would be very, very similar. And so um, when I look at, we'll say, um, I attached in terms of the uh, reading uh, an infographic we did on the recent NICE guidelines, and that would probably sum up those bullet points I'm covering there. So there's some, belief, some kind of common themes in back pain guidelines that are probably similar to knee osteoarthritis guidelines. So we'll just do that. And I guess my question to you at this stage would be, do you think that reflects what people with back pain and knee osteoarthritis receive? Now, um, one question is, can education help? So education is probably the simplest and simplest intervention we can offer. And it, nobody would really argue against education, but it's a different thing to say whether it actually helps. So we've done studies and lots of other people have done studies where we've shown it's easy to change the knowledge and beliefs of healthcare professionals. Uh, but there might be a wide range of reasons for this. So, for example, if I gave you on this webinar a questionnaire um, at the start of this talk, and then I gave it to you an hour later, um, it would be very hard, you want to be very brave, or um, else have fallen asleep completely, to not change some beliefs, or state you change some beliefs before and afterwards. So I've published research on this, and lots of other people have, saying, if you ask people how they, how they think about back pain before and after course, they say different things. And if you ask them how they would manage a patient, a theoretical patient or a vignette, a case study, they say they would do it differently. However, that doesn't seem to happen in practice. So for example, uh, we were looking in a journal club just this week at a paper by Overmere, um, a very nice study where they showed if you do a nice intensive training block, the, a wide range of healthcare professionals say very different things at the end and say they would act in more kind of a, an evidence-based manner and would handle patients differently. And then they did the clinical follow-up where they measured pain and disability and they didn't see a single change in pain or disability. In fact, when they asked the patients, did they notice any difference between these um, physios before the course and afterwards in terms of practice, they didn't even notice that they had changed a single thing. So education is a good idea. I'm not saying it isn't. Um, and it seems to be able to change the way we talk, but not the way we walk in terms of what we do in practice. So we've got to think about um, what type of education would help healthcare professionals change what they do if there's a need for that. But then what I'm here really talking about is whether direct to consumer or direct media campaigns can help. And I've attached two links there. One um, 
The first one is a group, uh, Rochelle Bushbinder, who many of you might know. Um, they did a big media campaign in Victoria showing that if they spent a lot of money and it was, you know, um, well disseminated in the media, you can have an effect, particularly on some of the expensive stuff like um, costs and disability costs and so on. So that's very encouraging. However, others have had, had I suppose, less of an effect. For example, a Canadian effect, and there was a smaller campaign in Scotland. And so we can't say necessarily the media campaigns always work. The things that stand out that were different in the Australian, the Victorian campaign, were they spent more money and seemed to have a bigger reach. Whereas if you just give a small drop of public information, it doesn't seem to be enough. So this whole concept of direct to media education, and, and for this I'm talking about, yeah, so me writing a, an article in uh, the Sydney Morning Herald or writing um, a blog or a Twitter or Facebook post. One challenge I feel is that any media campaign is a drop in an ocean of misinformation. In other words, it's, there's so many different, um, I suppose, uh, competing stories and competing narratives out there. And I guess I would ask if you were gonna try and change public health beliefs, is there any evidence I forget about checking my Q&A slots, but um, is if you were going to try and Im imagine where the average person in Melbourne or Perth gets their beliefs on knee osteoarthritis, I would say it's the equivalent of the BBC or ABC or whatever daytime TV channel is there, that that's probably likely to influence their own beliefs on knee osteoarthritis as much as any Lancet or CT. So can we give, I guess, when you think of a patient coming into us, I think it would be nice if we could have preempted some of their beliefs before they present to a healthcare professional uh, to prime them for the discussions with healthcare professionals if and when they get MSK pain. So for example, if you take somebody who's going to come in with knee osteoarthritis or symptoms similar to knee osteoarthritis in their 50s, I think it would be nice if over the preceding 10, 20 years, they had developed a view of knee osteoarthritis that had prepared them for the idea that an MRI wasn't necessarily always required, that surgery is something that they should step up to reluctantly and that there are very simple things in terms of exercise, weight management, mental health, not necessarily simple, but other things they could think about before they rush to more invasive and costly interventions. However, one of the things I want to talk about today then is that some of these discussions are much easier handled in a face-to-face -face environment. So for example, I've had patients here this week where we have to have discussions about the fact that their pain has either emerged or has deteriorated to a great extent at a time of great personal stress, whether that's related to work stress, financial pressures, uh, you know, other sensitizing factors have come up. And again, in a one-to-one -one situation where it's very private and they have a chance to tell me their story and they can see my body language, pick up on my tone of voice, I think there's a chance they can, I can express or display some empathy and some interest in them as a person. However, if I'm just handing out a leaflet in a clinic, just a black and white leaflet, here, here, have a read of this on your way out in the car park, or even more so, if this is just a pretty generic leaflet or a piece in a blog or a newspaper article or so on, it can seem insensitive to talk about things like um, tissue damage not being always relevant and things like mood and stress possibly being more relevant because that can sometimes reinforce unhelpful kind of a stereotypes such as people with back pain don't really have anything wrong with them and they're just looking for attention and they just need to relax and get over it. And of course, that's not what we're saying, but I want to think about that potential for the backfire effect. Um, and of course, that can happen in the clinic as well, but I think it's more of an issue in direct to media education. So here are some... Um, attempts of ours. Uh, a couple of different, so the first two links relate to a, an, a public media campaign we did on behalf of the Irish um, Physio Society. Um, and I've attached the long version and the short version there. Feel free to ignore them. Uh, but what I would like you to think about is in the first one, uh, in that leaflet, have a look at what the academics say. And essentially the academics massaged my ego and made me feel very happy and cocky and proud of myself about what a wonderful person and the wonderful work we're doing. But of course, that's nice. Essentially, they're not my target audience. There is, uh, that is a bit like, you know, the people talk about um, echo chambers on Twitter, but we are preaching to the converted when we talk about getting the other academics to agree. And even in this conversation today, like I am familiar with the work of, for example, JP and Sam. And so if I saw them nodding on the, on the webinar, go on, nod away there, Sam, and reinforce me, that we're going okay. But if I see her nodding, it'll be nice. But again, 
it should be relatively easy to get people from a broadly similar perspective on board. Um, and so those, some of that stuff works okay. And then we did this 15 things um, piece. So the Irish Independent is the biggest uh, newspaper in Ireland. And what was interesting about this is that really took off on social media. And I think it's been translated into eight or nine languages and it's been disseminated widely on social media. Now, there's nothing particularly dramatic or surprising about those about any of those pieces we put up there. They are essentially the guidelines and the systematic views that all the big groups agree on. Um, yet, when I do uh, media interviews with reporters, they're eternally surprised at the idea that maybe sitting posture isn't the single biggest thing in back pain or that, that manual handling isn't always uh, an inherently wonderful and sensible thing to do. However, so it's nice that Sam, JP, and some of the other physios and people who already agree with me would say that was really nice, Kieran, well done. What I want to really focus on today is the potential that we don't get the message right for the people who are most in need of um, hearing our message. So this is a sample, and believe me, there is more and worse, of some of the feedback we got um, from the 15 Things piece in the Irish Independent. And I'll let you have a read of the comments for a second. While I cry into my tissue. And what I guess, the reason I highlight these is that what we've got to remember is my target audience here when I'm, when I'm doing a piece. So if I was doing a piece on knee osteoarthritis, not that I'd be qualified, is I'm not really aiming to convince uh, Peter Chung that this, sense, this advice is sensible. If it's aligned with the guidelines, he'll probably already think that. I should be trying to uh, target the person who's coming into his orthopedic clinic. And in a perfect world, I'd be targeting the people with the worst beliefs. So for example, if you have somebody who's got a sore knee, but is not particularly disabled or very stressed or worried, you know, it'd be, like, it'd be nice to get them on board and get them um, thinking the way we think. But if we think of the people with the greatest level of disability, I think some of these people might be the easiest to upset and anger because they may already have had people questioning the legitimacy of their symptoms and so on. Um, and there's some specific things that stand out here. So for example, um, we had never, so for example, there's things we've said that clearly annoyed people, but there's also things which are a misinterpretation. So for example, the first one um, suggests that we were saying the problem was chiropractic rather than osteopathy and osteopathy might be good. And at no point in this 15 things do we even mention you should go for physio or chiro or osteopathy. We tried to keep that one as profession free as possible. Um, another one that comes up around the idea of manipulation is that, you know, somebody here, I hear a click in chiro and there's something definitely going back in, I can feel it. This is saying it is in our head. And again, we would never say that in, in, in the piece or even in the clinic that, you know, this is all in your head. But it is interesting that um, that's what they heard. And I can't dismiss that. Um, even the last line there of another example of the overeducated not getting back pain. You know, we, there is that issue of making sure that we are seen as not talking down to people and making sure that, yes, you have to be seen as having some authority, but also if the person feels you can't relate to them. So going back to that previous media campaign, we did a series of national talks. We gave a public talk in every... There's, uh, 26 counties in the Republic of Ireland. We did a public talk in every county, uh, different people doing them. And in one of them, we had a really, really bright, articulate, very nice guy doing it. He was probably about 25 and he looked about 16. And he got some terrible stick from older people whose basic point was, you're only a, a young fella. What the hell do you know about anything, life, never mind back pain? And, you know, he felt that was very unfair. I'd say it is unfair, but it's also maybe understandable. So then one slightly, I don't know if this is depressing or reassuring, but uh, other people have tried this and had similar experiences. So um, for example, if we look at, I'm just checking here, no questions. If we look at the CSP, um, they did a Mythbusters campaign. And again, a very similar broad idea, taking some narratives that are out there and challenging them in a reasonably gentle way. And then they published an analysis of their feedback. And again, some of, their, some of the same issues came up people sometimes felt their symptoms were being delegitimized or they felt that um, they were saying it was all psychological or that people should be able to self-manage their pain and they were trying to deny. There was even hints that this was driven from a kind of a money-saving um, angle, that 
you know, it was just people try, trying to deny people necessary care. And then very recently, I know um, some people you'll know yourself, James McCauley, Chris Maher, Peter Sullivan, had a very nice piece questioning whether ergonomics holds up for back pain. And there was a big kind of a, again, all the people who already agreed loved it. And then there was lots of people fighting back against it. And again, unsurprisingly, people who work in ergonomics uh, started to argue their position. But I just looked at that last quote as one example. This person said, I've 20 years experience, sometimes over 80 hours a week of week of programming, and I don't care how many degrees this person has, which again comes up, the chair makes all the difference. If I have a crappy chair, I'll be in pain within three hours, and at the end of the day, I'm buggered. Whereas if he gets his, I assume that's a fancy chair, that probably costs a lot of money. Um, if he gets the chair, he makes it through the next day. And I'm sitting there reading uh, that, and what I'm reading is the 80 plus hours a week. And I don't think that um, you can look at that person and think about the 80 hours a week in terms of a work-life balance and that amount of, you know, uh, being in one position, uh, that that's irrelevant, that it's all just about the design of the chair. But again, uh, very sensible, broadly um, accessible language used, and not everybody will in inherently buy it from the experts. So some questions, and I guess this is where... Um, we'll start looking at maybe getting um, some comments and some uh, suggestions on board. But is there an issue with public knowledge and low back pain? I don't think anybody would say that there isn't. So that's, you know, I would say at this stage, a given. Now, would better knowledge be potentially useful? Again, we would probably say for everything, better knowledge would be useful in some way, whether that's around smoking and alcohol and, and lots of kind of concerning issues. So it would be potentially useful the question is then, though, would it be enough? Because, again, educating, um, for example, the uh, healthcare professionals doesn't seem to be enough to change their practice. And even if you look at educating people around things like smoking and uh, obesity and so on, I think it's fair to say that most members of the public would understand smoking isn't necessarily good for your health, whatever, uh, about any other enjoyment. But just because people have that knowledge doesn't mean their behaviors change. I think most people even those who are considerably overweight would appreciate that changing their diet could address, at least to some extent, their um, weight gain. But again, changing behavior is tricky. And I guess I have to, th I think I've learned over time that there is a risk we will annoy already distressed people and then further alienate them uh, and even further diminish their trust in experts. And that's possibly harmful because they might run off and go to people who will just tell them what they want to hear and give them a simple but inaccurate explanation for their pain, especially if they already have health insurance and can be billed for an expensive, ineffective treatment. So I'm not sure how we balance the need for accurate scientific information because I haven't given up on the idea of, of educating the public. But um, balance that with the fact that you'd probably get more attention if you make extreme claims and extreme comments uh, or very simplistic ones. So there's probably, it's probably easier to get a piece published on like, I have this magic chair and it's going to solve all back pain. Wear these new shoes and you'll never hurt your legs again. Or, you know, here, try this machine. It'll cause some magical uh, change in your energy fields and then everything will be lovely. So question, is it worth the risk that I cannot control exactly what appears in print or who was also in the piece for balance. So I've had discussions around whether you're better if you're doing a radio interview to do it live, which is a bit more stressful if you're a kind of a panicky pale Irishman. Um, but then at least it isn't edited afterwards and you get a little snapshot where it can sound like you're saying it's in the person's head. And again, I, I, uh, you, could, you could weigh up those. But even when you do um, audio or, or email pieces with journalists, um, there is a, an understandable need, I guess, in journalism and media for what is considered to be balance. Um, so, for example, I did a piece in The Guardian on posture, and, um, you know, I said what I believe, which was fair enough, but then I could say in their defense they needed somebody to say the alternative to provide balance. But then as a member of the public, you just have two people saying completely different things. Um, and again, that's... Have I, so, you know, it's fine for my CV. I have another little interview done. That's fine. That's a bit of public dissemination. But has that really changed anybody's opinion or just added to the confusion? And then finally, if we are going to try and talk about public dissemination, be that, uh, and I guess healthcare professional education too, but if we talk particularly about the public, 
um, it takes a bit of time and a bit of effort. And to do it well, like the Bushfinder campaign, you need a bit of money. And who will fund this? And that's a big challenge. Because even if we look at professional bodies like the APA or the Irish Physio Society, the AMA, um, they've already got pressures in terms of funding. And then in terms of their role, they are essentially there to, to uh, represent their members. And there's got to be a great risk that if it's the APA or the AMA, it will be given with a certain lens and the role of physio or medicine will be enhanced or their profile and their importance might be shifted depending on who's paying for it. Whereas if you look at grant funding uh, situations, I think there's a lot of other things that might look sexier, whether it's you know medical devices and uh, implants and stem cells and virtual reality and things that sound suitably scientific. And I use that word, I suppose, deliberately in terms of there is a tendency to view changing beliefs around exercise activity, osteoarthritis, as being, that's a bit too basic. It's a bit too much like common sense, even if they are the most important predictors. And maybe if we could come up with something with some public-private partnership, it would be much more um, sexy. We might get some jobs created out of it and so on. So, switching it to knee osteoarthritis, would you recommend doing this for knee osteoarthritis? So would you do uh, a media campaign or a, and, and, and all that kind of stuff? Is it needed? Um, why or why not? What would be your pitch or your key messages? Where would you take them from? Would you go from kind of the perspective of guidelines and systematic reviews or your own clinical experience? Who would you ideally have giving the message? Because I guess my, my feeling about that has evolved since we've done some of this stuff. Uh, who will pay for it? Uh, and if you think nobody's going to pay for it, that's absolutely fine. Just remember, you're not going to reach very many people or, or other people will be able to edit the, edit, um, the content. And then emotionally and mentally, can you handle the abuse? Because um, you're going to get some, and it's going to be from people who are already, who are the people you are trying to help. So you'll get some abuse from vested interests, of course, like, you know, people who say, how could you say types of physio are not amazing or surgery is amazing, but I don't really give a crap about that. But it is hard if you feel there's these people who are suffering, who are the people that I think it's my job to help, and I am now adding to their distress uh, with my clumsy language um, and my ham-fisted attempts to get this message out there. Um, and that's it, I think. Cool. So I don't think we had any questions coming through yet, Michelle. So I'm um, sorry. Uh, I don't think we have any questions coming through, but by all means, feel free to uh, start firing some abuse or messages or whatever else. Well, maybe, can I jump in? Can you hear me okay, everyone? Yeah. yeah. Um, Karen, thank you. That was great. And look, really interesting. I think it resonates with some, definitely the work that we're doing. Um, some of the qualitative work we've started doing in the OA. So one of the, the key parallels I see um, is the idea that this goes beyond obviously low back pain, those really strong biomedical beliefs that just mm. go all the way across musculoskeletal pain, of course. Um, so when we're talking to people waiting for knee surgery for a knee joint replacement, um, the idea that um, they have been told at some point along their journey that they've been diagnosed with bone on bone um, and bone on bones caused by wear and tear caused by loading and therefore, why would I want to do exercise and further load my knee? So it's just a matter of getting into the surgeon, whether if they're too young, they just have to wait a little bit till they're old enough. But really, the only fix for bone on bone is to put cartilage back in the knee and have any joint replacement. Um, and it's interesting to look at how some things, um, when we talk to people, and we've done uh, you know, quite large qualitative studies, that the amount of people that are taking um, glucosamine and... Um, all, these, all these supplements that we've weird and wonderful things we've never heard of, green mussels. And, but where okay. that comes from, how does everybody know about this stuff when they don't mm. know about the benefits of exercise? Or it's really interesting, the ones that people pick up on, but it all comes back to that idea that there's those, those underlying yeah, biomedical beliefs. That I don't have cartilage, so if I can take a supplement to give me cartilage, yeah. then that's something I can actively do. 
And, and it is, again, from the perspective of that person, a very sensible thing to do. Yes, it, it, it makes, makes sense. perfect sense yeah. in their day to day life what makes them sore. Well, if they spend a lot of time on their feet or they do heavy activity, their knee in the short term for sure gets sore. Yeah. Um, and then, obviously, something that would shock absorb cartilage obviously forget about effectiveness but that could potentially do it what i'm always interested in that though is like i've never seen a radiologist and i could be critical about radiologists sometimes maybe not going the extra mile and including um epidemiological information saying you know you have this degeneration but this is common in your age but i've never in fairness to any radiologist seen the words bone on bone on a radiology report mm. or or words like crumbling or you know some of the the catastrophic language we see and my instinct is that that's always the helpful layman uh, explanation given by the GP, orthopedic surgeon, physio, yeah. in terms of, well, they couldn't understand terms like this degeneration and, and minuscule lesions. So I'll give them very simple words. But those simple words tend to be the negative catastrophic ones. Really damaging. Um, yeah. So, the, so for example, there's the argument that we shouldn't let some of these people have MRI scans. And I know in terms of funding, that's something Australia is looking at. Mm. But it... It's a hard argument to win if the, if the funding is allowed. But even if the MRI scan goes ahead, how it's explained and, and getting healthcare professionals to really back off how catastrophically we describe these things. Because again, even the fact that somebody's waiting for surgery, there is an element to which that gives the message, we're going to give you the real treatment. We mm. can't just give it to you now. But in the meantime, we'll amuse you with this other fluff. Uh, but don't worry, you will get the real stuff eventually. But yeah. all this other stuff, it's not dangerous, but you know, who are we kidding? It's not going to do a lot. Sure. Uh, and, and that's got to influence, um, I suppose, how much we can do. I see yeah, there's some nice questions. Editorial about, um, yeah, failing conservative treatment. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And they already tried, you know, this once because I went for a rehab for two weeks or something. So a couple of questions coming through there, Michelle. Yeah. yeah. So Claire, uh, hi Claire, regarding comments on articles press, do you feel it's appropriate to simply ignore the comments or should you read them to determine whether there's a common theme in the responses and what about internet trolls? That's a really good question. Um, so uh, it depends. I wouldn't recommend reading them uh, just before going to bed. Um, but I do think it's appropriate to read them because let's face it, I read the nice ones about them too. <laughs> so to get a bit of balance. Um, but there are some things, for example, I do discriminate, and again, this doesn't mean I'm right, but I do discriminate between the ones where I think there's a conflict of interest. And like, there's a lot. I got, I've got quite a bit of stick from one particular Australian radiologist who thinks I've suggested nobody should ever go for an MRI scan. Um, but my view of it is he might be well-intentioned. He also owns a big private radiology clinic. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, because I think professional biases and, and conflicts of interest can be part of it. But when I think about some of the things people said there, there's still some of the beliefs that people had that we think we need to target. So I still think I should read them rather than ignore them. But unfortunately, I haven't kind of um, figured out the right way to, to do it. And again, I think in a clinic situation, that can often happen. I make a complete mess of my initial uh, communication. And then the person I can see responds in a way that wasn't ideal, but I have the chance then to come back and clarify, which you don't often have in these formats. And then another question, um, thoughts around using public figures um, to convey messages instead of people like us. Oh yeah, and that's from a bunch in uh, Kurt, uh, Kevin, Nardi, Tara, and Danica. Yeah, so that's where I was coming up with that issue, uh, which I had placed up there around who would you ideally have giving the message? So I think they ideally you would have uh, patient advocates and celebrities. Uh, patient advocates, because they come with a sense of legitimacy and I've had this pain and so on and so forth and I've started doing a little bit of work in that space. Um, there's, so I think that's the best if you can have good patient advocates. I would say it is slightly difficult and I'd appreciate if other people had thoughts on this that sometimes the people who join a pain society or patient pain group and stay in that group for 20 years uh, they might really love the topic and, and be very kind of um, have changed their life around and be in a position to talk about the positive changes. However, a good chunk of them are still in the patient group 20 years ago because they haven't turned the corner, haven't really kind of turned their life around, and they can often have really rigid biomedical beliefs. So for example, there's people like Pete Moore in the UK who runs the pain toolkit stuff, and he does some really fantastic stuff. And again, has, has, done a, has a very positive message about self-management of back pain. And I think he's the kind of person that would be very good at getting this message out there because he can say, 
as a layman who's been through pain, look, I can appreciate where you're coming from and it's much more um, accessible and amenable uh, rather than the kind of ivory tower academic who doesn't know um, what they're talking about. Uh, and I think, yeah, look, the celebrities, it's a bit like the, the people who appear on ABC and the TV soaps. Having a couple of celebrities with a positive message is important because let's face it, there will be plenty of celebrities pushing unhelpful messages going off for the latest, whether it's glucosamine or PRP or whatever you're having, that will reinforce some of those unhelpful beliefs as well. Sorry, long-winded response. Any other questions? Another question from Claire. Um, regarding use of simple words like bone and bone, is this a matter of increasing health literacy of the population that you're treating? And with this, is it difficult because who will then be responsible for this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, essentially, I think having better health literacy, yes, that would be helpful. I guess though a lot of it is, um, it's probably just one component of it because even when we talk about things like health literacy, it's probably so confounded by all the other things that are connected to it like socioeconomics and the type of healthcare system you're in and so on. Um, I think in terms of, we'll say, getting radiologists and doctors to use simple accessible language and, and also ones that are not frightening, I think we almost have to nudge them to do the right thing. So one of the examples I liked that, that seemed to work well is Bruce Forster is a radiologist in Vancouver and they piloted a couple of different approaches in terms of, uh, first of all, allowing emergency room doctors to order imaging. So they piloted it first where the academic radiologist would come into the emergency room physicians and tell them, look, you should only refer using these criteria. And it failed and some of the reasons it failed was the ER doctors under severe time pressures felt this academic radiologist who's never worked in the ER didn't really understand the system at all. And so they, they tweaked it and what they did in the end, which seemed to be successful, was they, they put in what they called a medium stop. So in other words, a hard stop would be the ER doctor cannot order this imaging. The soft stop would be let them do whatever they want. And the medium stop was the ER doctor was still allowed order the imaging. Um, and their training was provided by another ER doctor, but it was only with certain terms and conditions applied. And these terms and conditions made the ordering of imaging quite difficult and time consuming. And in an ER uh, setting, like a lot of primary care settings as well, I guess, adding time to the consult was a big barrier. And so they manipulated that um, situation. Because I would say a lot of the time, you know, GPs particularly might feel under pressure to give somebody an antibiotic for their sore throat or give them an MRI for their knee or back pain because it's probably quicker and simpler than give, having a longer conversation. So how in the Bruce's example, having a person giving the message that would seem to be acceptable and manipulating the system a bit to make sure the inappropriate care was not the easy option, that might be accessible. Uh, and sorry, going back to the last thing then clear on the language, I think we really have to, so that was looking at manipulating the order of the imaging. I think we have to get to mandating imaging reports include this uh, term. So for example, um, epidemiological information. So if somebody's got disc degeneration at two levels and it's mild, as well as saying that, telling people what are the percentage chances you have that type of finding in asymptomatic populations. And there hasn't been much work done on it, but the work that has been done suggests that can reduce some of the markers of disability like uh, medication use. JP, considering the size of campaigns we can promote is dependent on funding, what would be your first option of disseminating knowledge to the public when we don't have the money? Yeah, um, so the stuff I guess if I had a if I had a, a plan at the moment, it's around trying to use the mainstream newspapers and radio stations, um, and trying to get them on board. Now it's a tricky one because oftentimes what happens is the media will contact say the APA or a medical organisation to uh, get a representative on board, but then you are kind of confounded by the fact that you're on there as a representative of a professional body with a vested interest. But I think. Thing is, until we get decent funding to run media campaigns, and we have an editorial coming out on media campaigns in the next couple of weeks, I think what we've got to do is probably use the existing public formats. And I think probably while I'll still do a bit of 
with our website PNED and some Twitter and Facebook stuff, I'll probably go more with the trying to access existing daytime TV, mainstream newspapers like that independent uh, thing. But again, that comes with the caveat that that necessarily won't be enough either. Um, another question from Kevin and the group. Is there a benefit in calling people out with the conflicts of interest, like the radiologists with the radiology company, so that people can understand why they would be saying what they do? Um, so I would say, yes, there is. Now, of course, you will get accused of, you know, that being an ad hominem attack or ad hom attack um, because I'm attacking the person and not the, the, the problem. But I think it's important that people are aware of reasons why I might as a physio, you know, I'm a physio, I'm unlikely to be the person who's biased towards surgery and medication. So people should know that about me if I'm critical of, say, medications. And so, but there is, but if I'm saying that message and the, G, the AMA and other representative GP bodies are saying it as well, well, then I think that makes the message stronger. Um, and I think, again, it's not just the radiologists, obviously, the surgeons, the physios, are, they're all different kind of um, barriers. The only thing is, it's tricky. I think rather than me kind of abusing the radiologist, and I'm not saying that's what you're suggesting, but rather than me abusing the radiologist or calling him out, I'm probably better off trying to get the insurers or Medicare or whoever the funder is to just disallow some of these things from being allowable expenses. Is one of the barriers to change beliefs in these companies the profitability aspect? For example, the money made. Uh, I would say 100%. Um, it's, it's very hard in fairness. Like if you look at the American healthcare system, it costs an awful lot of money to become just a physio, never mind a more expensive qualification like medicine. And if you're going to tell people, look, if you want to do this job, you're going to end up with, you know, a million dollars of debt. Can I really turn say to you, so we've made you, you know, as a society, we've decided you're going to be massively in debt to get this qualification, but now you should go and work for the minimum wage. So we really have to look at what we want, uh, how we want healthcare to be provided. And um, if we want healthcare to be provided in a way where profit is not the biggest motive, um, we have to make sure that there are ways you can make doctors, physio, surgeons earn a solid, good living by by um, providing good care. And at the moment, even in my own setting, for example, uh, here in a sports medicine hospital, which is not like we don't break even, we are we are we are heavily subsidised by the royal family. Yet in our billing model, exercise is a much cheaper and less revenue generating um, procedure than things like PRP, stem cells, surgery, and that kind of stuff. Um, so those funding models are a problem. If you've got a, you know, private medicine and private physio, they're not the enemy, but we can, we have to try and look at ways where things that are effective and sensible, like education exercise, are considered legitimate billing things. Because we've probably all had the experience of a patient coming in, giving them a what we would like to think is a comprehensive program of advice, education, reassurance, and some exercise, and the patient can be left feeling, but you didn't do anything. You didn't prescribe an antibiotic or give me some massage or, or manipulate my spine. And again, that's partly around making people feel that that's still an effective option. Um, Self-management is not abandoning the person. One question that arises based on that, again, is the idea of, like, I'm broadly an advocate of self-management, but also making sure that people are ready for it. So in the start back trial in back pain, there was, um, for the most of you will be familiar with it, but essentially people with back pain, there was, they were categorized in a questionnaire into low, medium, and high risk. And there was evidence that the low risk group were overtreated and simple advice in education and self-management was enough for them. And so that's a very important message for us to, to remember. We can definitely over treat with physio as well as medication and so on, low risk people. However, there was a, a subgroup within that low risk where they didn't do well with that um, self-management and advice. And that was the people who were already disadvantaged in terms of socioeconomics and so on. So in other words, there are people who probably are less capable of self-managing uh, and might need a little bit more mentoring. So obviously we don't over treat, but there are some people who are perfectly happy with that from day one and other people where they might need a little bit more. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, they might need the stabilizers for a while. JP, question. What are your thoughts in relation to changing beliefs in the public? So the request higher value here versus changing clinicians' beliefs to facilitate. Yeah, so it's almost like um, which should we prioritize or which would be more effective? 
targeting the public so that they are coming in saying to my practice, I think I need this evidence-based exercise uh, versus changing condition beliefs. Um, obviously, we'll all say we want both. I think at this stage, it's probably more important that the public uh, request higher value care. And I would maybe tweak it a little bit. And it's like, have the public understand what evidence is. So almost from a public literacy, not even health literacy, but understanding that the way you make decisions should be based on clinical trials and evidence and so on, rather than what is fashionable or what is the GP, you know, the GP or the physio's expertise. Um, and if we have the public understanding that, you know, when I'm going in, I want to get what is considered the best treatment, and that should be the same in Australia, Norway, Ireland, and Denmark, um, that then the clinicians might be in a position to kind of um, not give patients that what might seem to be the easy choice or for them or the person. But again, there's, there's probably lots of things. There's the public beliefs, clinician beliefs, the incentives for the clinician to give one type of care versus the other and what the government is willing to fund and so on. Karen, if I can jump in there. Sorry, I tried to write a comment, but as co-host, I have to speak instead. <laughs> but I am interested. Um, it, you know, I think that the GLAD model is interesting in that respect because you know, if everybody going to see their GP with knee pain knows that they're going to be referred to an exercise program, hmm. then that's an interesting way of, I think. What do you think about that model? Yeah, so like broadly, again, you could get into um, sweating small details, but broadly, GLAD seems to be very, and I'm not overly familiar with it, but broadly very evidence aligned, an emphasis on education, reassurance, um, exercise, and building up people's capacity. So I think that's hard to argue with. I suppose, as you say, there's it's a great thing though that if you are going in the GLAD program, you kind of know what you're doing and they are not getting the message that you're doing this until you get the real treatment, which is surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably positive. We probably have to be real, realistic as well then about the magnitude of the effect. So it's not that people are leaving the GLAD program cured. Um, and that's probably not the focus of today's talk. But again, that idea sure. that um, if a treatment takes my pain and disability from being quite bad to moderate or mild, that it has failed. Um, especially in terms of recurrent conditions like knee, persistent knee pain and persistent back pain. Like, I will get back pain in the future and I will get knee pain in the future. And like if I didn't, but that's just a fact of life. Sure. But if it lasts two or three days and, and it goes again reasonably easily, I don't really mind if that happens multiple times. Um, whereas um, I think there is a... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 I was, was going to say, I think that that's, that it is, I guess from the more of the belief changing point of view, I think, no, you're right. I don't think of it so much of the, have we reduced pain and disability, but more is the mm. power of changing that idea that we shouldn't exercise because we've got yeah. knee pain, but I will yeah. be exercising yeah. because I have knee pain. And I'd like, I, have, I don't know if they've done it, but it would be interesting to see almost in terms of the acceptability of GLAD or exercise or whatever we're offering, I would imagine it's far less acceptable if you really believe the bone on bone line the mechanical loading line. Like it would be very hard to tell somebody, well, just go and lift those heavy boxes over there if they really think lifting is dangerous. And if somebody really thinks my cartilage is gone and loading is a problem, you'd imagine they'll be less open to it. It would want to be a very charismatic or encouraging GLAD program to get them across that line. Mm -hmm. But again, we, they're, they're all important arguments. The idea that we'll get them, um, get their beliefs to change so they'll be open to this program. And then that the clinician there is singing a similar message. For example, in a perfect world, all the different disciplines have something to offer and we would agree with each other. Uh, so we'll say across the Opus um, organization, there's a wide range of professions involved. And my feeling is it's a broadly consistent message in the group that's involved in the, in the CRE. However, across those professions in society, it's likely that there's a, a lot of mixed messages. And so I would say there's, it would be great if you've got somebody at high risk of progressive or deteriorating knee osteoarthritis that they would see a, maybe a physio, an orthopedic surgeon, psychologist, maybe dietitian, maybe, you know, a range of people. But at the moment, I'd be nervous that some of them will, someone will surely mess it up and go back to talking about cartilage and degeneration and be careful. Um, so uh, like multidisciplinary care, it sounds like you're, you're um, a nihilist if you're against it, but I am not convinced that we do it well. Yeah, no, that's great. There's another one there from Claire. Can you see that, Karen? Uh, there was one that popped up and I lost it again. It'll I just see. More. 
I can read it oh, out to you otherwise. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. So, oh, that's from, oh, yeah. Sorry. So that's one there. Will you send that to me? That's okay. I can that's your it. one you just asked. Yeah. Yes. No, there's one there from Claire. So is one way to change the beliefs, uh, should we start informing patients about where they are sitting in comparison to the rest of the population? So, sorry, can, you say, can sure. you say that again? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So one way to change belief, should we start informing patients about where they are sitting in comparison to the rest of the population? So clarify, should we change beliefs by saying other people with your symptoms do this? 10% of patients with moderate oh, back pain yeah. do this. That's yeah, cool. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, I suppose we could, uh, you can always clarify again, Claire, what you mean. I suppose it's sometimes risky in terms of saying, oh, your pain is not as bad as somebody else. And I don't think that's what Claire is saying. Um, there's been work done by, you know, Taylor and Sunstein on nudging and trying to people to try and shape behaviors and kind of... Um, getting people, it's not in any way shaming people, but just saying, isn't it great that, you know, um, we've started this program and 60% of people have managed to get out walking, you know, three times a week in the last week. And if you aren't in that majority of 60% of people, uh, that seems to encourage people to do it. You know, so they've done this work in terms of trying to get people to do their tax returns and try and do recycling and so on. Um, I think there's probably value in that rather than it being a kind of a scolding, but rather kind of saying, and, and I suppose I'm kind of coming at it from the point of view of not comparing your pain and, and uh, disability levels, but almost saying the natural history and saying, look, you've got this pain now for three months. That's very painful. But what the likelihood is if we follow our trajectory for six months and also in terms of the things we are trying to get people to do, like exercise being one of them, trying to say that those people who have engaged with these things are more likely to do well and, you know, what proportion of people have already started, wouldn't it be great if you were one of those? that can probably be more empowering than, which I've done myself, scolding people in the past for being naughty boys and girls and not doing what I told them from the ivory tower. And I think that, Claire, also relevant there, even when we say that 50% of people can have a disc bulge with no pain, you know, be asymptomatic, for example, with low back pain, I, you know, you have people responding, well, so what? Who cares? I, I know my pain is real. I, I do have pain. What are you trying to say? So sometimes, yeah. yeah, I found that not to be so useful in a clinical setting um, and, the, and the patients the, I've spoken to. And the imaging stuff is interesting, like uh, to go off on a bit of a tangent, I, I used to do some clinics with a very, very nice, very um, compassionate and caring um, physician. I won't even say his speci specialty, but he, uh, we had a discussion. We, uh, we used to do some clinics together. And at the start of one clinic, we had a discussion around imaging. And I said, how do you interpret like, you know, things like this degeneration, disc prolapses, for faster joint degeneration? And he gave me a very evidence-based response where he said, look, a lot of people without symptoms have that and all the usual stuff. And then we saw that morning, 15 patients together. And all 15 patients, he provided a pathoanatomical description of their pain based on their imaging and their presentation. And he offered them interventions based on addressing the underlying pathology. And so at the end, I tried to kind of ask him, you know, at the start, we discussed that imaging isn't always relevant and you can have these findings without pain. And then for these patients, you seem to be thinking that it was the explanation of their pain and, and, and how do you kind of, how do you make sense of that? And he said, oh, like, I, I understand, but like these patients were symptomatic. And that was it. It was just once they were symptomatic, the imaging became relevant. And it was an eye-opening experience for me in terms of under, uh, explaining that people, you can talk about the, the genetic influences or the asymptomatic nature that these don't always cause pain. But once the person becomes pain, there's an assumption that, well, now it's painful instead of, so it's not enough to say this isn't relevant. We probably have to find an, another alternative narrative. And again, in those situations, some of those people coming in, because he was a very caring man, he had a very good insight into these people's lives. So I, I can specifically remember one lady, before she came in, he said, this lady, she's going through a really hard time recently. You know, her husband was died last year. She has two sons in and out of prison. And, you know, she's really struggling to sleep and cope with it all. And then she comes in and her pain has deteriorated in the last 18 months. And he talks about her disc degeneration and how it doesn't look like it's got worse than the scan, but maybe it's a bit worse. And I think we'll go in and we'll do some facet joint injections. So even when we have the knowledge of the person, it's still very hard to let go of that, that, that deeply embedded belief. Uh, I 
think we're done. And that looks like it might be all your questions. Does anyone else have any other questions or want to put their hand up for a verbal question? I think um, the other thing I suppose that's become popular just on that in terms of funding is it's now become a bit more sexier to have patients on board in terms of, you know, um, research funding and get their input in terms of design of research questions. And that's, that's good. I think most of it is still just very much a token gesture. Um, but it can be important in terms of, you know, designing research questions, but also I think particularly in terms of developing interventions that are feasible and then developing messages, what we're talking about today, that are accessible. Mm -hmm. um, I know one, one uh, lady I, I work with in Limerick, she does a lot on patient public involvement, and they did a thing where they asked patients for, it, it wasn't around pain, but the type of interventions that they wanted, they asked patients to self-select from a menu of eight the interventions they most wanted, and then the patients were provided with that. It's a pilot study. Um, but she said they chickened out, essentially, of offering patients whatever they wanted. They limited it to things that were broadly considered to have some evidence for them, and then they made it accessible. So it was that mix of, you know, you can't choose whatever you want, but here are some sensible options that might be, you know, not too expensive, and then you still select from those. And I thought that was an interesting use of, you know, combining evidence and patient desires and expectations and so on. And control too, I guess. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, for mm. sure, yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think we're done. At least the... Um, I'm not sure what I, I might have been doing something wrong with some of the chat questions popping up, but overall the system seems to have worked pretty well. Thank you very much, Karen. That was wonderful. I think everyone will agree. That was really informative and some really good cool. um, food for thought for all of us. And if anybody uh, asking questions or online had some, any thoughts on any of the materials in terms of some of the language or terms we used, because look, I'll probably still do some more of this stuff for a while. Um, feel free to um, send me any suggestions. My email is at the end of the slides. Um, and yeah, because we'll probably do things like this, but we just got to get them a little bit more um, acceptable and impactful and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And Karen, are you okay to stay on uh, more or less around yeah. your email for the next hour or so if anyone wants to email yeah. Karen directly? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I can stay on here or go on email, which is best? I think just we'll email. email. Yeah, email will yeah. be fine. Perfect. All right. So listen, um, thanks to everybody for having me. Michelle, thanks a million for organizing and making sure I didn't make a mess of the, the IT and the system and all that. And thanks to Sam and everybody else Went for perfectly facility. well. Yeah. Thanks very much, Karen. Okay, guys. Thanks we'll talk everybody. to you all soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.